Hi, I'm Alistair and I'm a games designer and I was recently invited to create a room escape game as part of International Games Week and in this series of videos I'm going to explain a little bit more about how I approached designing that room escape game, some of the individual puzzles that went into it and some of the technology behind those puzzles as well. So in this first video I'm going to look at how I approached the overall design of the experience. And before looking at any details of any individual puzzle elements and things like that, I guess the most important thing to lay down on paper is uh, some idea of the parameters around the experience you're trying to create and any constraints that might apply as well. So, as I said, this was an event as part of International Games Week, and that's something run by the American Libraries Association to try to encourage more people to engage in their local libraries. So. The first constraint I guess I had was in terms of the premises. Um, now this was an event that was going to take place at the Norwich Millennium Library and that is a fantastic building. It's housed in this beautiful glass atrium and it gets a, a I think it's one of the most popular libraries in the UK. It gets something like 1.3 million visitors a year. It's an absolutely fantastic space. So. In some ways, you can kind of think, well, that's not really a constraint as such. That's that's a, a marvellous opportunity. But at the same time, what that meant is we had to consider uh, the space that we were going to be able to work in. So this was an event that was going to take place on a normal Saturday. Uh, the library was open to the public as normal. And we didn't have a reserved area uh, that was going to be enclosed for this. We were going to be in a demarcated space, but in the middle of the library. So what that meant from a games designer point of view is that obviously I had to be aware of health and safety type concerns. We might have people wandering in and out of the play space. It also meant though that there was an opportunity. I actually wanted to create a bit of a sort of a public spectacle so that maybe passers-by that didn't know the event was going on could actually stop and get involved and, and watch a little bit about the experience that was going on as well. Um, and it also meant a little bit about some of the um, possible props and settings and scenarios that we could use, which I'll talk a little bit more about when I get into the puzzle design later. But one of the first things we decided was that although this was a room escape game, um, we were not actually going to lock anyone in any confined spaces at any point. Um, Room escape games historically might have involved actually uh, being in a room with a certain time limit and the objective being to get out. But what we find now is that uh, room escape typically describes a whole variety of experiences. And it's more a description of the kind of puzzles that the players have to solve along the way to uncover some sort of mystery. So no one was going to get locked in any spaces. And we also didn't have any kind of multi-room capabilities. Uh, so sometimes when you're designing uh, sort of the narrative around the game, it's quite nice to progress the flow of the game at a certain point by opening up a new area, for example. That wasn't going to be available to us in this particular game. So that was, again, something I, I needed to kind of work with a, a single constrained space. But I wanted to make it um, visible to the public and a sort of not that it was in a walled off uh, area, but, but make it more of a, a public display. So the second parameter to consider was the uh, target audience and the demographics of who we were expecting the players to be. So uh, this was an open event, anyone could subscribe to it, but we were particularly aiming at uh, teenagers and young adults. That was the brief given to me by the library. And what that meant was that uh, in order to appeal to that group and to design an experience for that group, I could expect a certain amount of uh, prior knowledge and kind of sorts of interests perhaps that uh, young adults and teenagers might have that perhaps other people don't have. For example, if I was designing a puzzle that involved props like um, a tablet or a mobile phone or using the internet or an mp3 player, something like that, these are all very common devices which I could expect this group of people to have a, a common understanding of. Um, if I was designing for a different group of people, another common set of props might be uh, typewriters and magnetic audio tapes um, or, or, or sort of rotary dial telephones, things like that. These are all very common props used in all sorts of styles of escape rooms. And it's just about 
as a designer being aware of how much familiarity your players are likely to have with those props and how much they will instinctively know how to use them. Now, that doesn't mean you should always design props around uh, technology that your players are familiar with. Um, a lot of the time, you can actually create quite sort of playful experiences by deliberately using props, either that are unfamiliar or using props in a way that are perhaps um, not the normal way you'd expect to use them. Um, so I didn't want to only restrict it to things which um, the players sort of have around them all the time, but it's something to be aware of in terms of how much additional direction the players might need to have. Um, I mean, one example, so I did use a typewriter in one of the puzzles here, and I think of something like 25 people that took part, I think only one of them had actually seen a typewriter before. Um, so that's the kind of thing to, to, to be aware of when considering uh, your audience type. The next parameter I wanted to consider was about the group size that was going to participate in the event at once. So we've already considered the demographics of a typical individual player, but uh, escape rooms are normally team events and the dynamics of the team obviously depends uh, a lot on not only the individual makeup, but how the group is formed. So we were inviting people to uh, sign up individually to this event. I didn't expect that the team had entered as a unit, which again, you might do in some other sorts of games. So they wouldn't necessarily know each other or knew each other's skills or knowledge or how to work with each other at all. <clears throat> and the other thing is how large a group you want to consider at once. Now, the library wanted this to be an open event for as many people to take part in as possible. As a designer, I was a little bit uh, nervous of that because um, what you find is that as you add additional players to a team, up to a certain point, they add skills and knowledge and the team becomes more capable. But beyond a certain point, what you find is that the additional noise that each player generates actually degrades the performance of the team. And beyond a certain point, the, the kind of cooperation and communication just dissolves completely and it's no longer a fun experience for the player. So through a sort of a process of somewhat trial and error, we settled on a, t a maximum team size of 12 people and we were going to run the event twice. So two groups of 12 people were going to, uh, to take part. And that figure um, then became significant when I was planning the uh, flow of the game in terms of the number of uh, parallel puzzles that could be worked on at the same time and how I opened up the flow of the game, which is something I'll come back to a bit later on in more detail. And I guess the final uh, parameter that I wanted to set right at the beginning was in terms of the overall outcomes and the overall takeaway that I wanted the players to have. So room escape games are obviously entertainment. They're fun. They're designed to be an enjoyable experience. But you can have, uh, I guess, additional outcomes on top of that. So at the moment, for example, there's a, there's a lot of escape rooms have a uh, scary theme. So they're fun, but what they do is they seek to thrill and exhilarate the player through um, fear, for example. Um, you also get uh, corporate escape games where the objective is perhaps to try to enhance teamwork or communication of a, of a workplace team uh, through involving them in sort of shared puzzles. Now, the outcome I wanted to have um, was that players would have a good time, obviously, but also I wanted it to be an educational experience. And that fitted completely as well with the library's objective. So there are different ways that we could have incorporated that. But what we settled for was actually um, to run an escape room game itself that players would take part in. And then following that, to have a workshop where I'd actually describe how some of the games were created and where players could ask me questions about it as well. And that would incorporate the educational aspects into it as well. That then had a follow on in terms of the timings of the event. So um, escape room games typically last about an hour. Um, if they're much longer than that, then sort of players lose focus. If they're too short than that, then there's a risk that people actually solve it way too soon and kind of don't get their money's worth, don't get the full experience. Now, um, because we wanted to incorporate time for the workshop as well, 
And because we were dealing with perhaps younger players than, than maybe typical, we settled for half an hour for the escape room game and then about a 20 minute workshop afterwards. Um, so that was how we agreed the timings of the day. So with all the basic constraints in place, uh, we could now begin to think about the theme and the narrative of the game. Now, how significant the narrative is varies a lot between escape games. Um, sometimes you need to pay attention as a player to kind of every detail given to you in the backstory and all of the characters' narrative because they might be used to solve a puzzle later in the game, for example. Um, other times you'll find that the theme is just a very loose way of uh, kind of tying separate puzzle elements together. But I think it's important to have a theme and a narrative because it's that that gives the experiencing some sort of consistency and context. And it's what really provides a room escape experience rather than it being a, a simple series of uh, unconnected logic puzzles. And the narrative also provides the players with some kind of degree of um, purpose and motivation. So why is it that they have to solve this uh, series of puzzles? Why is there a time limit? Um, what happens if they succeed or if they fail? So if you were setting up a room escape game uh, from scratch in an empty unit, you could probably design a theme around pretty much anything you want. Um, being on a space station or in a pirate ship or in a mad scientist laboratory are all very commonly used themes in room escape games. Um, for this particular example, uh, we were taking place in a library and there was no point trying to pretend we were anywhere other than a library. We were very obviously there and there was really no need to because that's uh, such a fantastic place really to set the narrative and the theme of a room escape game. So we had kind of one theme about libraries and books the other um, component, I guess, of the theme was that because we were there for International Games Week, it was also easy to write that into the theme and narrative as well. So we have books and we have games are going to be the main thematic elements around which all the puzzles are based. In terms of the narrative, I'm a games designer, not a story writer, um, so I'm not really does I'm not going to write a very long narrative that goes into masses of, of uh, contextual backstory and also given the age group that we were aiming for um, I didn't think it was necessarily appropriate to have a huge long detailed um, narrative either but what I wanted to do was give the players um, something to sort of just set them about to start them off on the puzzle solving uh, kind of experience and then concentrate on that but I also wanted to give them a little bit of a, an element of um, surprise. And that's, I guess, something you can surprise people through unexpected solutions to puzzles or unexpected uses of items. And you can also surprise them with narrative. Um, and I, it's quite nice to start off with a surprise, I think, because that sets people um, kind of on edge, a little bit uneasy and perhaps can encourage them to think more creatively than they would have done otherwise. So how we kind of decided to incorporate that was that the event itself was actually advertised as a room escape game jam. So in all the marketing, uh, when people were signing up, all the players, all the posters and everything else, simply described it as a game jam or a workshop. And players thought they were going to come along and discuss what is involved in creating a room escape game. Uh, when they turned up, what we explained to them was unfortunately the chief librarian who was due to deliver this workshop had vanished, had gone missing. They'd set up all the equipment ready on the table in front of them, uh, this series of puzzles and books and locks and, and whatever that uh, the players were meant to be discussing, but the librarian who was due to deliver it had, had gone away. And we kind of embellished this uh, in case people were going, oh yeah, that's a bit corny, which of course it was. Um, we did a tannoy announcement uh, over the loudspeakers in the library um, and this was sort of a, a brilliant moment because you, people actually began to kind of unsure at that point whether to doubt the story or not we sort of said will professor cornelius please report to the uh, the library demonstration area to take part in the escape workshop and you could kind of see the look on people's faces going well we don't really know if this is real or not which is perfect that was the exact uh, state of mind we wanted to create with sort of people doubting things when they started off. 
and we also sort of got members of the library staff to, to join in the conversation. So that was the context. Uh, that was the, um, the, the theme was about books and games. The narrative was that the person due to deliver the workshop had gone missing. Um, but because they'd already set up this equipment, perhaps the players could uh, unravel the mystery in some way um, and find out what had what had happened, and that was going to be the starter to kick them off. So we've got the constraints and the parameters agreed, and we've got uh, a rough sketch of the overall theme and the narrative of the game. Uh, the next step in the design was to get uh, an idea of the game flow. And so uh, what I'm going to show you now is the, uh, the final plan of all the puzzle elements that were involved in the game. Now, I didn't just sit down and come up with this as it is. It went through several iterations to get to this state. Um, I shuffled things around, deleted some things that I wasn't happy with, um, broke it several times along the way as a result. Um, but this is the final layout that players took part in uh, on the day. Um, so I'm going to talk you through it. So uh, it's essentially a flow chart and the direction of the flow goes from top to bottom. So blue boxes represent physical objects. Uh, green boxes are actions that the players need to take and red boxes are knowledge that they learn that is then required to solve future puzzles. So um, this is not a particularly complicated diagram. Remember that this is only for a half an hour um, experience and we wanted to leave time to explain how it works. So I wanted it to be a usable model, but something that was that was relatively uh, straightforward to explain. But the same concepts that apply for this plan would apply to almost any um, room escape design. So in terms of flow, what I, what I really want to kind of describe is the overall shape of uh, the experience. If we look at the start at the top of the diagram, the game begins with a relatively few number of items. Um, you don't want to overwhelm the players with too much information all at once. So there's a handful of items that have been set up on the table in front of them, and they've been there all the time. Um, that's the blue boxes with these red borders around them. Um, but I don't want those puzzles to be immediately solvable, um, or else there was a risk that players would kind of arrive and start solving the puzzles before the game had officially begun. Um, remember that this is taking place just in the middle of the library area, so it's not like I can have a, a closed door that I can kind of open at a certain point and start the game officially. I had to have some way of um, marking the start of the game to make sure that players wouldn't solve puzzles before we were ready. Um, so there's also these blue boxes with a green border around them. And those were the items that I gave to players after the introductory uh, kind of briefing which I gave to them, which is where we explained that the, um, the professor had gone missing. And uh, that involved giving them some items such as um, CCTV camera footage or supposed CCTV camera footage of the last sightings of the uh, professor and, and things like that as well. So um, every puzzle from then on required combining either two or at least two physical objects or making use of some knowledge from a previous puzzle. Um, and it kind of trickles down through the uh, the game process here. So if we look at the middle of the diagram, um, what you'll see there is that the chart has widened. As the game has gone on, um, players have discovered new items and unlocked new knowledge, and there's different ways, there's more different possible combinations in which the puzzle elements can be combined at this point. Now, remember that I was planning this for a maximum of 12 people, and that's significant here. If your puzzles themselves involve relatively small physical props, like a book or a packet of cards, for example, there is only physically so many people can get actively involved in that puzzle at one time. Um, just you can't all crowd around a book and see it more than about three people at once. So I needed to make sure that the graph, the flow at this point, was wide enough so that there are enough parallel puzzles could be going on at once. Um, each of the vertical strands represents a kind of a chain of actions that different groups of people can be following. And the more of those strands that you have alongside each other, 
uh, the more people you can get involved in, in playing the game and being actively involved at once. Um, it's the greater the degree of uh, parallelism that you've got going on. Um, if you just had a, a, a single chain of object puzzles, uh, you know, unlock a box, get a key, use that to unlock a padlock, get a code, use that to unlock this. If that was just a linear sequence of events, what you'd do is you'd be creating a bottleneck and all of the team members would be waiting behind just the few players who were actively involved in solving whatever single puzzle was kind of at the, the head of that linear sequence at the time. And rather than making them purely parallel though, you do try to create this sort of slight bit of crossover where you have the outcomes of one strand then feed into the outcomes of another. So you get it with a little bit of um, kind of tanglement between the lines there. That is a way of controlling the flow of the game to make sure that players don't solve all of one vertical strand before another one's even been started because you can introduce these kind of dependencies across the different strands. Like I say, this is a relatively simple graph here, but you can imagine how these would become more and more complex and uh, you can control the flow of the game and the way in which players uncover certain experiences um, through adding those additional dependencies between the strands. And then if we look at the end of the diagram, we'll see it narrows down again to just uh, six boxes. And these represent six different padlocks that need to be open on a final box. Um, these padlocks are all attached to a single hasp um, and I think that's a really nice for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that if you have a box with six padlocks on it, um, it has a perceived value to the player. It, whatever is in that box must be very important uh, to have six padlocks protecting it. Um, and that really reinforces that message that this is something that the players want to unlock and want to find out what's in it. Um, and sure enough, I mean, that was the final goal item in this particular puzzle was in that box. Um, another one is that it gives the players a little incentive, a little reward as they progress through the game. So as each padlock gets taken off uh, that lock, it kind of provides them a little bit of uh, spurring on to show that they're making progress. And it's also a very clear visual indication of how far through the game they are and what they've got left to do still. Um, there's a real buzz when there's only one padlock remaining, you see, and it kind of focuses the whole of the rest of the team on solving whichever puzzle leads to that final uh, padlock solution. So that kind of concludes the overall design of how I approach the game. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to look at how I created some of the individual puzzles that fit into that game flow.